and welcome back to Redefine Parenting. I'm your host, Vinu Keller. We want to welcome you to Spanglish World Network and her network on Zingo TV, channels 250 and 251. Please remember to download both the Zingo TV app on the respective app stores and iOS devices. While you download, make sure to rate and leave a comment. The app is free. Zingo TV is also available on Google Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Fire Sticks, Roku, Roku Sticks, and all smart TVs 2016 and forward. So today, all my great listeners, we're in for a treat because I have a dear friend who is just making waves in the entrepreneur world, helping entrepreneurs to think big. He has this great podcast out there. Um, so without further ado, Sean Osborne, welcome to Redefine Parenting. I'm so excited to have you on our show today. Well, thank you for having me on the show. This is exciting and I am uh, can't wait to get into this and it's something that I'm very passionate about on parenting and the mistakes that I've made in the past, the things that I've learned. And uh, so I think it's going to be a great, uh, a great show. And there's so many things that we can talk about. That's the thing. Right, right. And one of the things that, you know, I was on your show and I wanted to bring you on my TV show and podcast because we started talking about the balance between being an entrepreneur, our different types of you know, work life, relationship life, family life, social life, you know, and it's about the harmonizing of it. How do we harmonize everything that we call life? Yeah. And, you know, you being an entrepreneur and working with a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, I have my own opinion, but I would love to hear what are you seeing right now, especially, I mean, more and more people, especially after COVID are opening their own businesses. Like, yeah. it's like every time you turn around, there's another person that's like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur now. Because things closed down, people had to make money, people got innovative during COVID. And, you know, now there's a lot more entrepreneurs. So just with your background and what you're doing, and if you don't mind, real quick, sharing a little bit about what you do so people can understand, you know, your model of the world and when you answer how you're seeing people that are entrepreneurs balance their family life. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for God, 35 plus years. And, you know, so that's really my, ba well, my background is, you know, I've, I started a company back in the nineties, uh, which was my first company that I actually started. Were you 10? And, Were you 10 years old then? Yeah. I mean yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll say that we'll say, we'll, we'll tell my, my 13 year old granddaughter that, yeah, I was 10 back then. So, <laughs> uh, so, you know, back in the nineties. And as you said, uh, I think the biggest thing that we're seeing, you said that we're seeing a lot of people who are doing a side hustle, they're doing a side gig, they're having, you know, it's almost like they have to, you know, whether it was COVID or, or whatever, but it reminds me a lot of what I went through. So back in the nineties, I was in a full-time job. I was in corporate America running IT for a company, started my little side hustle that started getting bigger and bigger. And we all do that. So all the people who are doing side hustles, like that's the point where I had absolutely no time for my family. Right. I mean, you're literally working two full-time jobs and trying to get things done and trying to do things. And just, there's no time. I mean, again, you're, you're running two different jobs. So back in the nineties, that's what I did. And I, you know, successfully started that company. You know, fortunately I was, I got out of the corporate America and just went full-time on my company at one point and eventually sold the company. Uh, God, I think it was 2000, uh, finally sold that company, but it was probably the hardest time of my life and probably some of the best things, but also the most regrettable things is from a family standpoint is I did that. I, I traded my time with my family and with my kids for trying to start the company and trying to, I didn't realize that I should have had a balance there. That's why I'm so passionate about this. I could have had a balance if I would have known that there was a way to do that. I right. would have been able to have that, uh, you know, have that balance uh, that I didn't do. And that, again, that's probably one of my biggest regrets from starting that company. Back yeah. Then. You know, I, I feel you because, um, and I know you have the same mindset as I do is that if you know better, you can do better. And we didn't know better then, you know, I mean, I can't tell you what it's taken to get where I'm at with my business, you know, and, how much I've sacrificed my family time to yeah. get to where I'm at. And here, here's the I irony of this all. And you and I've had a big discussion about it. And that's why I wanted to bring you on. Cause I'm like, let's have this discussion on my show. It was our why for doing what we're doing is to give our family a great life to, to live life with our family. 
And yet we're sacrificing living the life with our family to create the life we want to live with our family. You know, it's like how many things I have to miss out on with my kids because I have a client or I have to do this or I'm traveling to go speak here or I'm going to go speak there. And it just happens to be at the same schedule as a soccer game or, you know, a dance thing or whatever it is. Right. Right. And so we sacrifice the time and yet we have to work to pay for all the extracurricular activities. We want our kids to thrive. We want our kids to live their dreams. We want to support them in getting privates here and doing this. And yet we're missing out because we're working so hard to give them the life. And so we're not living the life we want to give them. Yeah. We're trying to create it. Yeah. And I think that's okay short term. And I think this, sure. so when I'm, when I'm working with people and working with clients, I think that's one of the biggest things I see. It's like, there is a time to plant seeds. There's a, there's a time where I'm going to have to work 70 hours a week. I understand that. I have to get stuff done, right? You just can't do that. But it's not always like that. And what we end up doing or what I see people doing is they they do that. They get into that and then things slow down and they they have time, but they don't then take that time to go spend with the family. They they scroll. They do, uh, what other stuff can I come up with to, to get stuff done? And they stay busy. Again, there, there's times that we have to. I understand. As in any entrepreneur, I don't care what career you're what what business you're in, there's a time you got to put your head down and you got to work, but there's a time that you don't, and you got to make sure you spend that time with your family and you put that first. I agree. And you know, one of the strategies that I use to get used to that, because you're right, it's, we get so comfortable with busy that when we're not busy, we're like, what am I missing? What am I not doing? I was just talking to my, one of my clients about that the other day is that she's always trying to find busy work to do because if she's not busy, she doesn't know what to do with herself. She feels like something. <laughs> and I said, I get that. And she, of course she's an entrepreneur. So is her husband. And so I said, why don't you start doing this? Start scheduling it. You know, you put everything else in your calendar. I said, do you follow your calendar? She goes, absolutely. Whatever's on my calendar is what I'm going to do. I said, start scheduling it, schedule your dinner from five to seven. That's your time with your kids, you know? And um, I even started scheduling like, you know, lunchtime, like from 1130 to one, if my husband's home, that's my time with my husband. We'll go to lunch. We'll go run an errand together. And now I don't have to schedule it because it's almost like if I'm not doing it, I feel like I'm missing something. Right. And so I had to train my brain to not be busy in my work and be busy in my life. And that's the shift. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the, so one of the things that I do with, uh, with a lot of my clients, especially first on is, I teach them how to win their day before it begins, win yeah. their week before it begins, win their month before it begins, then win their year before it begins. And it's like every day, and I still do this. This is a remarkable tablet. Every day I put down my schedule. I write it down. I have my wide, you know, my open areas. I have my blocked areas. And every single day without, without fail, even on the weekends, I mean, it's kind of, I guess there's kind of sickness there, but even on the weekends, I have stuff scheduled out because if I don't do that, then my normal routine of, well, I'm just going to scroll on Facebook or I'm just going to do this. And I don't do those things. So I think it's incredibly important, at least until you get into the the habit like you of, of doing that, that you have to schedule that out. You have to do that. Right. It's so funny you said that because my husband put a beautiful post the other day um, about, you know, um, how hard I work. And because I just bought myself a, my, my 50th birthday is coming up in August. And I just bought myself a, a car for my 50th birthday. And he put a beautiful post, which is just a tribute to how much I work for our family and how much our family really appreciates all that I do for us and everything. And um, it was like the afternoon, I was going downstairs so we can have our lunch. And he's like, you haven't been on Facebook yet. And I'm like, well, that's an odd thing because you don't really go on Facebook. And, he, and I said, but no, I haven't been on Facebook. He's like, huh. I said, do you think I sit in my office all day and scroll on Facebook? <laughs> I've been too busy this morning to do Facebook. And I said, do you want me to go on Facebook? And he's like, no, 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 I'm not asking you to go on Facebook. I was just, I didn't realize that you weren't on Facebook all the time. <laughs> like literally, I think this man thinks I'm on Facebook a lot. And um, so I, I went on Facebook and I, and I saw, and I saw what he put, which was a beautiful tribute to me. And, you know, it was, it was just really nice to be acknowledged from my husband like that. But the point is, is that my Facebook time I've learned is my downtime. So what I mean by that is if we're driving somewhere and he's driving and I'm in the passenger seat, 
I can take a nap or I'll scroll on Facebook. You know, if I have, if I'm at the doctor's office and I'm waiting to be seen, I'll scroll on Facebook. Like that's the, my downtime busy, but that I have nothing to do. So that's when I use it for my social media. But I'm going to tell you, there was times again, trying to be busy and not even with work, but I think a lot of us get stuck in that. So we're not seeing what's going on with our kids. We're not spending the time. We're watching a movie with them, but yet we're on their phone. Our body's there, but we're not there. Right. And we can't multitask. We think we can. Right. But we're not we're not present when we do that. Yeah, we're absolutely not present. Yeah. And so, you know, to me, I would rather be a producer on Facebook. Like I would rather be a content creator and not a content consumer. I think that's oh, the I big the, the big difference is being a being a being a consumer of it or being a creator of it are two totally different things. But here and and I and I love that. I love, love, love that. You know, um, I just had the honor of speaking at an event last week and Trent Shelton was there. And one of the things that he said resonated with me so much is that we don't need another role model. We need a real model. And what he meant by that is like, think of the word role. You know, you have a role in the play. You have a role, you know, in your, your business. And those roles are identified of what the expectation of who we're supposed to be in that moment. And I thought about that and it just landed with me because I'm like, that is so true. And versus a real model is someone who is living what they say. They're authentic when they're not living it. They're like, Hey, I'm not living it. Like I screwed up. You know, um, I always, I was joke around. I'm like a few, a, a few weeks ago, I was no longer the parent whisperer. I was the parent yeller. Like there are moments where this shows up for me and I speak about it because that is who I am right. to say that I never yell at my kids. I'd be a liar. And I don't, I want my listeners to know that I am vulnerable and I still go through changes and I still go through my growth periods and I still have to rehear what I tell other people and start practicing a little better, you know, and that's being a real model. And so what are we telling our kids when we are so busy creating? And like you said, there's a period we got to create, right? We got to plant the seeds, but there's also a time that we have to harvest it. Yep. Are we taking time to harvest or are we again? creating busy time. So we're not really paying attention to the harvest. We're not paying attention to our kids because we're too busy being yep. busy. Yeah. And we do that. I mean, absolutely. That's, that's, I think that's kind of a default thing that we do when we're in, especially early entrepreneurship. It's like, I would sit down and I would create three more products in my head of what if, you know, what if I create this product? What if I do this? What if I do this? None of those ever you know, went to market, but I still wasted that time where I wasn't really planting a seed. I wasn't really generating anything for, you know, for the future, but I wasn't taking that time to, to be with the, be with the family. Right. So when did you know something had to change? <sighs> Too late. I mean, <laughs> right. so, you know, it's like, so we went through that, that time. And again, this was back in, in the nineties. So my kids were, you know, they were middle school, junior high, you know, time frame back then. And I wasted a lot of time doing that. I think I really realized that once they were grown up and once I actually started to develop. So when I started doing my own development, when I started getting uh, curious about myself and learning about mindset and learning about growth, that's when I realized, holy crap, I screwed up. I mean, there was things that I did that I, well, let's, let's say this. There was things that I didn't do with my kids that I wish so much that I had, had the knowledge back then, you know, whether it was being uh, positive thinking, whether it was, you know, encouraging gratitude. Like I never encouraged my kids to have like a gratitude journal or to be grateful for things to, you know, uh, encourage curiosity. You know, there's so many things that I know now being a mindset coach, being a mind, you know, performance coach, mindset performance coach that man, had I done that and they turned out great. But again, I regret this. Like had they had, had I done those things that I know now, man, what would things be like now? You know, it's so funny you say that because I was just having a conversation with somebody the other day and how I look at, cause I'm like you, I have older kids that are 29 and 20, almost 25. And then I have almost next week, my, or yeah, next week, my twins turn 11. So it's a big age gap. Big, big age gap, right? And 
I look at the parent I am today versus the parent I was to my boys. And I look back and I was like, wow, like I am so, I, all I want to do is apologize to my boys, you know, but again, you only, you only can do the best that you can with what you know and what you have. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. And somebody said to me there, they said, but you were exactly the mom they needed in that moment they needed you the way you were in that moment to be the men they are today yeah and you know yes life has its ups and downs and they have their challenges and they have their growth periods but i got into personal development when my oldest was 13 and the other one was eight i think turning eight and so I started to realize that I didn't even know about gratitude. So once I was able to learn it, I started implementing it on them. Now, now our twins know the Ho'oponopono prayer, the uh, the 10 words. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. They say it every day since they were three years old. That is their nightly prayer. And then we say, what are you grateful for? We started this at the age of three with them. Imagine what that does doing it every day. Like even when my husband and I are off at an event, working an event or something, they will call us just to do the Ho'oponopono prayer and tell us what they're grateful for. They taught it to my in-laws. They taught it to my mom. It's like the ripple effect from kids when we take the time to teach them. And I love what you said. It's not even about us being present with them hours on end, but it's what are we teaching them? What are we installing? What are the values that we are getting to install in our children? And when we know better, we do better. And, you know, for my listeners out there, that's exactly why Sean and I are here tonight to help you take an inventory of what are you not doing because you didn't know that if we can teach you tonight from this day forward, it's going to be better without the regrets that, you know, Sean, you're saying, like, I have some regrets. Yeah. What I oh, do so. Yep. You know? And and so and it's it it's even simple things. It's like things that are that we say to our kids, the things that we sure they pick up everything around us. I mean, again, you know, we are programmed by the tribe by the time we're you know seven years old, whatever the beliefs were, whatever the you know, we we understand that. But I remember once when I was a kid, and again, my mom was, it was out of love. It was not out of, you know, trying to do anything. But I remember one time we were in a crowd of people and uh, someone came up to talk to me and she said, oh, Sean, he's, he's really shy and pushed me behind her and said, oh, he's shy. He doesn't like to talk. That right there is just, it wasn't out of mouse. It wasn't out of being, but that right there put into my subconscious mind, oh, I'm shy. I don't want, I don't get in front of people. I don't talk to people. Right. So it's even simple things like that on, on how we communicate with our kids and how we uh, interact with them uh, affects what they do uh, in the future. It affects how they, how they are. You know, and I think, so now I've got, you know, grandkids, my oldest grandkid is uh, she's 12. So I get to try doing these things that I didn't get to do with my kids. You know, I got her at a very young age. I got her a gratitude journal that she writes in every day. So, so there's things that I'm able to do now uh, that I just didn't know then. So again, like you, if we can show parents that are in those earlier stages, you know, some of the mistakes that we did and they, and they listen and they, and they, and they implement some of these things, it can really have a positive effect on their, on their children. I like what you said though. And, and you, and that's a great distinction you made is that what your mom was saying to you, you took on as an identity that I am shy. And so again, what are we saying to our kids? What identity are they taking on at a young age? And it's so funny because I remember, so my, I have twins, boy and girl twin. And my one twin, when he was little, like my, my daughter is me, like she'll talk to anybody. How are you telling people? I love you at the age of two. Every, we're walking down Walmart because I love you. I love you. I love you. And then her brother is like zipped at the lip, like nothing, like shy, like putting his head down, doesn't want to look at you. And so he would hear us tell people, oh, he's shy. Like we would make as if we had to make an excuse, you know, right. like, oh, he's shy. And it's so funny because I look back at even that and I was like, why were we even labeling him shy? What if he yeah. just didn't want to talk to the person? And so as he got older, he's like, because I'm shy, because I'm shy. And he took on that identity as well. And so we don't even realize that 
some of the times that we're making excuses for our kids of their behavior in public, which no one's asking us, no one's even curious about it, but we're already putting it out there. We are helping them develop an identity yeah. based around it. Yeah. And, and when, and when we do that at a young age, that impacts way more than if you were older. Right. So there's, you know, I look back at that and it's like that, set the stage that even though I had plenty of experiences in life that said, no, you're not shot, Sean, mm -hmm. those still did not overwrite that earlier program of, of being said I was shy. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, 10 years ago, before I got into uh, 12 years ago, before I got into personal development, we would not be doing this. Oh yeah. I would not be on a podcast. I would not be on stages. I would you at 12 years ago, if you said, Sean, are you going to be on stages? Or are you going to be doing these types of, I'm, hell no, that was not me. I was shy. So it, again, <laughs> it affected me for a long time. And it's funny because there was times that I wanted to be shy. Like I wanted to not be the loud one, the one that just everyone sees. And, you know, there are times of that. And still I have this like brand that I grew up with, like, oh, Vini will do it. Vini is loud. Vini will do it. So if you would have told me 12 years ago, I'd be doing this. I'd be like, I hope so. Tell me how, <laughs> how can I get on a stage? <laughs> and yet there's a part of me that's like, but do you really want to? I'm like, no, 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 you have to, because that's the expectation. And that's what it comes down to is the expectation we're putting around the labels we're giving our kids or the expectations that we allow our kids to believe society has for them. Right. And themselves. So just, you know, going back to harmonizing our work life as entrepreneurs and how we don't have to feel guilty because we're not being present in their lives. So we talked about scheduling time. That's one thing um, you had brought up a great opportunity too. is like it's not, it's what are we filling them with? What are we teaching them? What are we giving them opportunity to learn while we're at work or, you know, busy? The other thing you said is stop trying to find your your busy time when you don't need to be busy. Yeah. You know, make that extra time for them versus trying to fill that time up with busy work. Um, another thing I like to add is um, be present. So when you are with your kids, and I mentioned a little bit about it, about, you know, being on your phone when you're watching a movie with your kid, engage with them. Like one of the things that I see with families is that, especially busy entrepreneurs, is that they want to come in. They have these expectations of what their kids are supposed to do, especially the older kids. They come home. It's not done. And they're barking orders at them. Like, oh, I told you to do this. You should have done this. I've been working. We're supposed to be going to your game right now, but this is this and this is that. And the parents are out of rapport with their kids. Yeah. You know, parents don't even know what is going on with their kids in depth. They think they know because the kids are obeying, the kids are doing their chores, the kids are polite, you know, the kids ask instead of tell. And they don't know what's happening behind closed doors, like what's on their social media and how to communicate with them, how to keep them safe. And I had an awesome guest on our show um, not too long ago, um, Chris McKenna, and he is the founder of Protect Young Eyes. And we had this discussion about how we can keep our kids safe. And here's the key thing. We have to be present with them. Yep. You know, the same way, like you and I are both entrepreneurs. And I think that we would agree on this. There's no way we would have found the success we have found in our business if we weren't present with what our business needed and what our business and what we wanted for our business. Right. What would it look like if we did the same thing with our kids, right? Absolutely. Now, I, I, I'm curious on your thoughts on parenting style as far as friend versus parent. Because uh -huh. I think there's I think there's a line where there's got to be at least a grown up in the family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's got to be someone. And that, you know, that can't always be a friend. So it's like that. that is a hard line right there to to be in. I love this question. So the first thing I always tell parents is your child will find another friend. They're never going to get another parent. Right. What is parenting? It's being that model for them. I'm going to use the word real model for them 
that they know that is going to keep them safe, that they can trust, that, you know, you're there, a metaphor is to kiss the boo-boo, right? And make it better. And, but here's where parents are falling short. They want their kids to like them because they think if you like me (laughs) and if we're cool, that I can guide you better. And what's happening is the kids frontal lobes are not developed. You know, for a boy, it develops at 28 for a girl, it develops at 25. So what's happening is the minute you find out because you're the cool mom who's hanging out with your kids, that there's, you know, problems in paradise. And now you got to put your foot down. You've now lost respect from them. They now don't trust you. Now it's like, but you're my friend. Like now you want to be my parent. And I've had clients that have told me that. It's like, my mom's doing this with me. My mom's doing that with me. My mom's hanging out with us. And and then all of a sudden my mom finds us out. And all of a sudden now I'm grounded. It's like, now you want to be my parent? You were my friend the other day and now you want to be my parent. And you're wondering why I'm disrespecting you. I'm fighting with you like I fight with my friends. Thinking that we'll make up like I make up with my friends. Yeah. Because their frontal lobe's not developed. They don't understand. They don't have the executive reasoning. They don't understand the long-term effects from what's happening today and how it's going to affect us years from now. They don't have it. Even Dr. Amen has said, you know, in one of his trainings I've done is that we have got to be the frontal lobe for our kids, especially in their teenage years. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things that my parents did in, to me, it, it was actually a blessing in disguise. It's probably the best thing they could have done for me at the time. I don't know if I could ever make that decision, but they let me go at 15. They, I, I was out of the house, homeless, uh, since the age of 15. And I, I know I'm speaking with them. I mean, my mom's passed, but my dad, you know, I speak with them. They're, I had a great family. So it was 100% my fault for what, you know, the things that were going on. Got hooked in, you know, got hooked on drugs, got with the wrong crowd. And they... But first of all, let's just acknowledge that. So because there are parents out there that probably do have kids that are on drugs and stuff. And they're thinking like, this is the end all be all. They're going to be a junkie. And so let's just take a moment, you know, to kind of segue to say that was who you were. Yeah. And look at what you have now. So what we're saying out there, parents who are listening, there's hope. Absolutely hope. Not done. They're done at 15 just because they're making choices right now that aren't conducive to what you want for them or what you want for their future. Yeah. And I don't know if I would be where I am had they coddled me and said, you know what, we're just going to, they said, they cut the cord and said, you know what, John, you're going to do that. You're on your own. And so that was a very hard reality check for me at, at 15. And, but it was the best thing that could have ever possibly happened to me, at least for me at the time, because it woke me up. It said, you know what, I've, I've, I'm out here on the street. I'm going to have to grow up pretty quickly. You know, I'm going to have to do things and, and get things going. So it's sometimes it's being a parent is hard. And again, I don't know if I could make the same decision my parents did. That's that's a damn. That, that's a hard decision to do. Well, you and I grew up, I think, in the uh, 70s, 80s. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. Okay. So back then there was this also this movement called Tough Love. Yep. And I think that's where it all started with that there's no more coddling. We went from an era of coddling and are are you a Gen X kid too? Yeah. Okay. So us Gen X kids, and this is what's important to understand for our listeners out there is that there is definitely differences in the generations. And if we think we're going to raise our kids the way we were raised as Gen X, we are going to fail because as my daughter said, we were talking about her phone and she wants a real phone. I'm like a real phone, your phone, calls and texts. What else do you need? She's like a real one. And I'm like, honey, that's what a phone is for to call. Like all we could do is call. She goes, cause you guys had old phones. <laughs> like, <laughs> old, we had old phones. It was interesting. But anyway, so again, different times, different situations. Yeah. And then it was our generation that our, we had to grow up because the mom now is going into the work field or parents were getting divorced. So you had single parents and it's, they weren't home anymore. It wasn't the leave to beaver family where, you know, word would go to work and mom's there cooking and we all came and had a family meal. You know, it was very rare. It was very rare to see that in growing up in the eighties and nineties. 
And then that tough love movement came where it's, we can't coddle because coddling them is keeping them in the problem. Right. And so it's time you cut that cord, cut the cord like your parents did. And now I think we've moved back into a generation of, oh gosh, especially the millennials, right? Oh, we got to do better for our men. We got to hold our millennials. We got to treat them better. Like they can't have a life like us. We, they can't be grounded. They can't get hit. We can't <laughs> do that. I know I, I raised my boys that way, you know? And yeah. um, cause I have two millennial boys and I look at the entitlement now, the entitlement. And now we're going back to if they fall, be their cheerleader, teach them by, you know, verbally teaching them how to get back up. Don't go and physically help them back up. Yep. Give them an opportunity to stand and walk on their own. Because to me, if, if we don't, we're, we're, we're screwing them out of the opportunity to grow and learn. I, that's just how, you know, that's how I feel. It's a hundred, you're a hundred percent right. And but again, you look at the Gen X kids and look at what we're doing now. Yeah. You know, a lot of us are entrepreneurs. A lot we are innovate. We're the innovative kids. We had to be. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's when the computer came out. It's when, you know, when we were becoming adults, the internet came out. It was like we saw what was coming in. Like, I don't know about you, but I used to watch the Jetsons and I'd be like, talking to someone on a video, that would never happen. Hence, yeah. here we are today. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, robots. Yeah. And now you said something. I want to kind of go back to you. You said something a yeah. little while ago because I, it's another one of the things that I probably regret or uh, something I've at least become aware of is, you know, and you said something in the thing of, of supporting their interests, you know, supporting what they do, supporting yeah. their ideas. And I know for me, I put my limiting beliefs on what was right or what was wrong my limiting beliefs on what I thought was possible was not possible on my kids. And I remember one, you know, my daughter, she was in high school and she came and said, I want to go to the cosmetology school. And for here, that's like Botech. That's like the vocational. It's like, no, you don't want to go to go do that. You don't want to do that. We, we stopped her from doing that. We, we, we said, no, you're not going to do that. We didn't allow her to do that. And move up, you know, eight, 10 years later, she owns a damn salon. It's like, so it's like, had we listened to her, would she be further ahead? And it's like, I, I learned then that I can't put my limiting beliefs on what I think is right or what I think is wrong on my kids or my grandkids because they don't have the same lens. They're not looking at the world the same way I am. They're not programmed the same way I am. So for me to say, yes, you can or no, you can't, uh, is really just my own limiting beliefs coming out. Right. I love that. And it's so funny that you, you mentioned that because my mom, when I was, you know, getting done with high school and stuff, my mom's like, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I want to be, I want to do hair. And she goes, no, you don't. I said, oh yes, I do. I've always been good at doing hair. I still am good at doing hair. And she's like, no, there's no money in it. You're not going to do, my daughter is not going to do this. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, Okay. Well, I guess I'm going back to school for psychology because that's what I thought I wanted to do until I love doing hair. And now it's so funny because, I, you know, my husband and I have six kids together and, um, it, you know, we have mine, his and ours. And, you know, our two of our daughters um, want to go to cosmetology school. Like one of them just graduated. She graduated on Monday night and she's going to cosmetology school like that's And I, I'm excited for her. Yeah. I'm so excited for her. And then her sister, she's like, well, I want to go to cosmetology school, but then everybody's going to say I'm copying Lily. And I'm like, honey, if that's what you want to do, if, if, if it is copying her, good for you. You found, she found an interest. You found an interest. Maybe you guys will open up a salon together. You know, yeah. I mean, don't play small because someone's opinion makes you feel you need to, you yeah. know? And I agree with you. It's like, let them flourish in whatever they want to do. My son says he's going to be in the World Cup. Okay, well, we're going to do whatever we can to support that. It may change in two years. Okay, then we'll change with you. You know, we're just here to be, to guide you, to be that GPS for you, if you would. Yeah. You know, and I, so I'm so glad you said that. Um, you know, I have my video program, Crack the Code to Parenting, and it's, it's week two that I say, you have to put your baggage down. 
you have to put your baggage down to raise your kids, to see your kids through fresh lenses. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I think we're all programmed through the course of our lives on how we see things. And uh, we can absolutely change those programs. We can change those things that we see and how we see them. And uh, yeah, so I think it's a, uh, you know, and you, and the other thing that uh, you, know, you said, we, we've got to celebrate the results. We know this from the things we do in like neuro. Right. We've got to celebrate our kids and let them celebrate. And God, there's just so many things that I wish I'd, <laughs> as I grow and I learn more, it's like, man, I wish I'd done these things, you know, long before. And, you know, celebrating their wins, celebrating their ideas or, you know, let, letting that creativity come out. To me, that creativity is the, the thing that sets us apart from all other, you know, creatures on this, you know, in this world is we can imagine what we want to do. We can imagine things that uh, and, and if we hinder their creativity, uh, we're, we're creating a, a huge disservice for our kids telling them, no, you can't do that. Or It's so funny because I wrote this book. Um, teach your children that they're enough. And if anybody wants it, it's a free download, the um, QR codes, you know, um, on here, but you can just go to be inspires.com slash ebook to get it. And there's three chapters. The first chapter is um, don't blame and shame. The second chapter is just be present. And the third chapter is celebrate. If you want to give your kids their self-worth and their self-esteem here, here's, here's the recipe for it. It's literally those three things. Don't blame and shame them. Be present with them and celebrate. It's exactly what you and I are talking about. And honestly, that's also the recipe to harmonize your family life. You know, yeah. it, it's the same recipe to harmonize your business life. If you don't blame and shame what's going on in your business, if you're present with your business, and if you're celebrating what's going on in your business, imagine how that will flourish. Yeah. You can take these same principles and apply it to parenting. You can take these same principles and apply it to your relationship with your partner. You know, yep. um, I had Dr. Stephen Cowan on here and he had read my book when we met and he's like, your book is spot on. I was like, what? This doctor is like saying my book spot on. I was so excited because he's an amazing doctor. He wrote fire child, water child. He wrote the five elements to understand our kids better and to understand us better, you know, through our personalities. And here he's like, your book is spot on. And, and I'm not a doctor. I wrote this book out of experience. I wrote this book out of, you know, the, the, the several coaching <laughs> certifications I have and learning, you know, that's what I wrote this book on, you know, by no means in my PhD or anything, but I have a PhD in my life in my experiences and being a parent, you know, I say that I had almost every title in parenting. I was a single mom. I was just a boy's mom. I'm now a mom of twins. I'm a mom of adults. Um, a mom of little ones. I'm a grandma. I was this, uh, a, a, a working mom. I was an at home mom. You know, I I'm now a co-parenting mom with my husband. You know, I literally have almost every title of mom, yeah. which means that I have every experience of different lenses of being a mom. And, you know, I don't feel I have regrets because I don't think I'd be the parent I am today if I didn't go through the journey of being the parent I was back then. And That's now true. I can do it differently. Yeah. And I have a granddaughter who's, you know, almost six. And the best thing I can do is like when she comes here and she says, Mimi, you have to work. And I said, I do. But then when is it your time? So I'm constantly pre-framing like, hey, you're going to have your time. I never did that with my kids. They never knew when they were going to get mom time ever. Yep. So it's again, letting our kids know you are worth it. And I tell this to the entrepreneurs I work with, because most of my clients are entrepreneurs. I said, your kids don't need eight hours because you put eight hours into your job. If you gave them 15 minutes of hundred percent presence, communication, effective communication, where you're listening and you're sharing and you have that pitch and catch conversation with them. They will never know if you spent eight hours with them or if you spent 15 minutes with them because it's the quality of the time that you gave them versus the quantity of time you gave them. Yeah. And the second thing is no kid wants eight hours with their parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> Nor grandkids. They've had a few and then they're, they're, they're on their own. I want to get your opinion actually on like 
mindfulness for kids, like, you know, whether it's meditation or yoga uh, to help kids manage stress nowadays? I mean, are you seeing that from a parenting standpoint? Uh, I am. I am. And that's such a great question because just like we need to find, how do we de-stress our life as entrepreneurs? How do we teach our kids? Because again, if we're modeling for them, then they need to, then they'll pick it up as well. And what I love, like my kids go to a private school and they bring yoga in there. I, you know, every once in a while they'll have a kid's yoga class, which is great because it's practicing mindfulness. It's about getting your mind still. And what we're finding is it is reducing the stress. You know, my kids will, when I say, you know what, you need to take a breath. You need to take a breath. Like we've taught them this. They will... <laughs> They'll go, they'll sit cross-legged and they'll say, um, they'll start singing Kumbaya, which is so funny. I don't know where he got it, but <laughs> at least he's settling down. He's sitting, he's getting still and he's settling himself down, you know? So that is a great question is we need as parents because stress is actually the number one killer in the world. Like it's not smoking, it's not cancer, it's not car accidents, it's, it's stress. Stress is the number one killer in the world. And it's not getting any better. It's not. So if we want it to get better, we got to teach better. Yeah. And it starts with what are we teaching our kids now? What are we teaching them now to, first of all, focus on what is stress? What What is stress that we're feeling and what creates it? And if we know what creates it, we can get in front of the cause instead of trying to get it at the effect. Yeah. So, you know, that's exactly what I'm seeing is that we have to teach that to kids. And, you know, a lot of it is some things that de-stress us. Like if people say, well, what do we teach our kids? Well, what do you do? For me, I listen to music. You know, when I'm at the gym, when I go for a walk, you know, I'm not a big meditator, but, you know, there's times that I just stay still. You know, I listen to an audio book. I listen to a great podcast. You know, and so it's, it's telling our kids, like, you need to check out of what's creating the stress at times and get away from it. And yeah. And, yeah. And I think so. And, and going back to kind of the entrepreneur stuff, you know, I think at least I'm seeing more where it's more lenient for parents to be able to have their kids while they're doing side gigs, while they're at home, while they're like when, when I was doing my company, it's like, if you ever did any type of stuff, it's like kids were not allowed. It's like, you Absolutely not. If we ever did, obviously we didn't have Zoom back then, but it's like kids would not be there. It's like you are, that is, that is an absolute no, no. Kids are not part of work. And, and I'm seeing more and more now where I'm working with clients, I'm working with, you know, uh, business owners and they'll have their kids with them on Zoom. They'll be in the, they'll be in the room, they'll be doing stuff. And it's like, I think that's getting more and more open for, you know, where it's not taboo or, you, you know, it's not looked, you know, it's not frowned upon or we can have our family participating in, in some of the stuff that we, we are doing. Right. You know, it's interesting that you say that because in my mind, when you think about that, I, I think of, I think it was in uh, the UK, the guy on BCC or whatever news channel, and his kid kind of just like walks in <laughs> as he's doing this new cast and everyone's seen it because we're during COVID. It's like <laughs> we're at home broadcasting and kids are there. And it almost started to give everybody permission. Yeah. You know, they laughed about it. They thought it was cute, but it also made it real. You know, yeah. as much as I tell my kids, okay, I have my TV show today at eight o'clock. So stay downstairs. They come up and I hear things. And I was like, well, you know what? If they hear it, people know, like, this is my house. This is my life. I got kids, you know, and it, it happens. And it's, it's a part of our life. Today, I was coaching someone and my husband comes and he's like, I am so sorry, but I got this deep splinter in my my hand i need you to get it out i told my client i'm like i am so sorry excuse me please took out the uh splinter and i'm like okay where were we and she goes oh my gosh i just love you i love how real you are okay <laughs> you know instead yep, of we're, feeling i think bad, it's okay now yeah it is instead yeah. of feeling bad she's complimenting me because she gets to see the realness Cause this is, this is where we're at. This is, you know, but here's, here's also what I'm finding. I'm curious what you're seeing too. A lot of entrepreneurs, they're working out of their homes now. Absolutely. 
And, and I think that's where it's going to go. And so here's one of the things that I wish that I had when I was in my entrepreneurship or the things back, back then is I'm seeing a lot of people that are traveling with their family and going overseas. They're doing all these traveling and they're being able to work while they're doing these things. And to me, that is the most amazing thing that's happened with all this stuff since uh, I think it started happening obviously with COVID and, and things, you know, being changed around. But I wish like, I wish I would have been able to have that when I was, when I had young kids, because to me, if you want to be present with your family and you want to be present with your kids, going on a trip to another country, learning another culture, being there, doing that, I don't think there's another way to get closer to your family and get closer to yourself because you're, I mean, again, if, if you never leave the U S or you never leave wherever you are, it's like, you're, you're reading the same page every single day. And it's like, I see these people that are able to do that. And I really envy, and I look forward to seeing other people doing that same type of thing. Yeah. I love that. And I mean, cause I do it, you know, if we have to go on a trip, I'll say, we got to go on a trip and I try to just get my clients in the first two days. So I have the rest of the vacation with them. Or I do it like first thing in the morning and then while my kids are sleeping and then we can go on out with our day, you know, um, and, it, and it's, it works beautifully. It, it, it's so great. Like and my kids are year round school. So they're off for like three weeks in March. We always go see my mom because my mom's in Idaho. She's taking care of my grandma who has dementia. So my mom can't travel here anymore because she takes care of my grandma. And so we go visit her and my stepdad. And we're there for three weeks. So my kids get like 21 days of just, you know, their nanny and their grandpa because we're there and I just work, you know, I, my coaching practice goes on, you know, um, I'm an instructor. So I still do my teachings on Fridays, you know, from my mom's house. And it's so beautiful to be able to do that with my kids, with my husband, being able to have the freedom to travel. Cause I'm going to tell you, like, that's what freedom is. Yeah. Freedom is not being tied down. Not being yep. tied down by your bills, not being tied down by time, not being tied down by location. You know, it's the freedom to move, the freedom to be. So, um, so we're 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 down to our last couple minutes. So, um, just to kind of tie a bow around this, um, if you could, you know, maybe give like your three top tips that you're giving to entrepreneurs that have families from the lessons that you've learned, what would you be telling people? I would think probably kind of if I go on some of the top, top three things is one model, positive thinking, model, creativity, model, model, the things that are possible and don't, don't ever teach daydreaming. We all need to go and daydream as much as we can because that's where the creative process comes in. So let your kids daydream. Be extremely positive if you can and, and really promote and celebrate, you know, really to me, their results, not their efforts. I mean, excuse me, their efforts, not their results, because the efforts are what counts. Uh, their efforts into doing things are really what counts more than to me, more than the results. And just being an encouraging, positive parent. And again, I wish that they taught mindset and mindset development within schools. That's probably one of the biggest things that I think is missing from our education is we don't teach people how to think. We teach them what to think, but we don't teach them how to think. And I think by you being a, a mindful parent and you breathing into them and you let them be in creativity, that is teaching them how to think. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, you know, um, Sean, I'm sure we can keep going on about different topics between entrepreneurs and, you know, the family. But I think, you know, I want to thank you for, you know, creating this conversation with me to help entrepreneurs because we both work with them. And we both know that families are the core reason of why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And we can't let go of that when we're just creating. You know, we have to be able to harvest the seeds that we've planted because everything in life has a season and a reason. Yeah. So thank you again for joining in. Thank you to my listeners for joining in on the conversation again, together we can give children a childhood. They won't have to heal from again. One of the resources is my ebook. Their QR codes right here on screen with us, or you can go to my website, vnewinspires.com slash ebook for a free download of my ebook. Please get it to help your kids today. 
share it with other people too, because it's a free resource that will cover exactly what Sean and I were talking about today, actually. This show can also be heard on Spanglish Radio Network. Please check out Spanglish, uh, www.spanglishworld.ca for all your news and programming. Spanglish World, watch it, hear it, read it, download it, and live it.